Hi everybody, thank you for coming. This is the panel devoted to discussing exhibitions at Shelburne Museum. My name is Lee Dowling. I'm very fortunate to be a guide here at Shelburne Museum. And this is the third panel discussion we've had today. And the smallest group that we've had. We have one hour. We may or may not use that hour. But the first thing I'd like to do is thank you once again for coming and celebrating with us here at Shelburne Museum and the Pizzagalli Center for Art and Education. It's been a terrific day, and I think we'll get some really important insights in the next few minutes. You're at, invited to ask questions. Please, if you have questions for our panel, put them in the back of your brain. I'll come around and give you the microphone. You ask the question because we are filming this. Okay, great. So I'm going to ask all the members of the panel to introduce themselves and, and tell you what their positions are here at Shelburne Museum. So we'll start with you, Rick. I'm Rick Kirshner. I'm Director of Preservation and Conservation, and I've been mostly involved with the uh, uh, helping design and put the systems uh, in this building so that they're safe for the exhibitions. I'm Barbara Rathburn, I'm the registrar at the museum, and we're responsible for tracking the objects throughout the entire museum complex and loans um, when they're borrowing objects for uh, exhibitions in this building. We're responsible for making sure the artwork gets here safely. I'm Corey Rogers, and I'm the curator of design arts, and Jean and I worked really closely on this project um, with the Color Pattern Whimsy and Scale exhibition. I'm Jean Burks, I'm the chief curator, um, and I just should say that you were looking at the two curators in this entire museum, so there were just two of us here. <laughs> wow. Okay, I'm opening it up for questions. But also, I'm sure that everyone on the panel has something they'd like to share with us about what they've done or what they're planning for the future here at Shelburne Museum. So does anyone have a question right off the top that you'd like to ask? Well, the first one that comes to my mind is, so what's happening here at the Center for Art and Education starting in January of 2014? Um, let me just start by saying that we will be having uh, changing exhibitions in this building and we do exhibitions in three different ways. We either uh, put together shows based on our collection, which the current exhibition is, color, pattern, whimsy, scale. We either do that or we come up with great ideas for exhibitions, whether it is in this building or other buildings, and we borrow objects from private collections, from uh, other institutions and mix them in sometimes with our objects. And the third thing that we do, uh, and this will be new because we now have this space, is to uh, borrow packaged exhibitions that were developed by other institutions and we can bring them into this uh, very state-of-the-art temperature and humidity controlled space, which is something that we couldn't do before. So those are the three types of exhibitions that we do. I'll let Corey talk about what's coming next. We have a series of exhibitions that are coming up in January. The first is um, John Bisbee, and this is an amazing artist. He's a professor at Bowdoin College. He's a professor of 3D media, and he's working with nails, and he creates these really interesting geometric patterns um, out of nails. But for this exhibition, it's a special commission, and he's producing works that are more naturalistic and organic in nature. And so when you come in to see John Bisbee's exhibition entitled New Blooms, you'll see an entire field of freestanding flowers made out of nails, which I think would be nice for anyone in the dead of winter here in Vermont. Um, on the lower level, I'm doing an exhibition called Super Cool Glass, and it's an exhibition that's based primarily in our collection. But what I've done, because we have such an interesting and diverse collection of glass, is identified how glass was used in different spheres of life. And so we're talking about architectural glass, we're talking about scientific glass, we're talking about food consumption. And I've also found correlations in the works of contemporary artists that we will bring in so that it brings the present and the past together. That sounds really, really interesting. I'm looking forward to that. I, I'm sure most everyone here is. Thank you. Are either of those exhibits coming from another institution or are these both self-generated? They're all uh, generated by the museum. Fantastic, thank you. Questions? George. Yes. I think you can hear me properly. Well, no, actually, I have to give it to you for the television. I was 
willing to sit down with. That's all right. So for major exhibits, I'm just curious how far in advance one needs to start the planning, and then also for the financing, does that start immediate? In other words, what's the process? I'm sure there's an idea, and it's brought probably original, uh, eventually to the director, right? And then financing probably starts after that. It, I'm just curious about the, the order by which these happen, and I'm thinking of larger, major exhibits rather than smaller, smaller ones. Oh, and one other small question we had. What that slit in the, built in the ceiling is, it's not a, it doesn't look like a screen. I'm just wondering if it's ventilation or temperature control. The one right above you? Yeah. That's a track light. It's what? It's for track lights. It's a light, track it's light. a light track. So that we can get lights that come straight down onto us. Not yet. Let, let me just answer your, your question about Please. the order of things. And um, it really, I think, depends on the exhibit. In some cases, uh, we, we uh, have a, sh a show that's presented to us. For instance, coming next fall will be a packaged exhibit called Homefront and Battlefield. Um, we wanted to do something that dealt with the, the Civil War because it's such an important anniversary. Um, we are not a history museum. We are an art museum. So we did want to have an exhibit that celebrated the art surrounding artistic objects that were created during the Civil War. And so this exhibit became possible, um, Home Front and Battlefield, which features textiles made uh, at home and on the front. And that we knew about, I would say, oh, probably 18 months ago. So that came up. We had to get on the schedule. And so we went for it. And that the fundraising started then, and we locked in the exhibit. Um, if we're creating our own exhibits, we, we try to do it, uh, ideally, a, a year ahead. Um, if we're doing a, that's primarily for a decorative arts exhibit, if you're doing a paintings exhibit, that's another story. If you're trying to borrow great works of art from the Metropolitan Museum or other institutions, they often will ask you for, well, Barbara will know better, a year yeah, to... At least a year, two years, I know. Uh... The uh, Wyeth Vertigo exhibition, I believe the planning for that started at least three years ago in order to coordinate um, borrowing a tremendous amount of artwork from private lenders and from other uh, museum institutions. We're planning, um, we're hoping to do a specialized, uh, a very specialized furniture exhibit in 2015 and we were already, we're right now working with a foundation to help fund the catalog and that's quite far ahead that's two years ahead so it really depends on the um, on the exhibit the type of exhibit and who has the money and the deadlines for the grants a bit more details on the exhibit you've probably seen which is a Wyeth exhibit we did start about three years ago and what really made that exhibit possible was finding a curator that had the connections to the various museums and of course the knowledge about the subject and Joyce Hill Stoner was her curator in that one, who also happened to be Wyeth's conservator. And so there was a, an, another tie in there. And, uh, and so one day, actually, we came up with the idea because we have one, one Wyeth painting, the Soren. And when Stefan was here, Stefan and myself and, and went down to visit Joyce and just laid out a bunch of books on the table and started scheming about what type of a, what type of a focus to have on it. And during that conversation, as we looked at all of these, I think what Stefan was saying, you know, all of these, some, some are looking down on the object, some are looking up on the object, but all three artists, uh, N.C., uh, Jamie, and Andrew, take these strange views of things. And I think Joyce said, yeah, it's almost like well, Wyeth Vertigo. And that's where the title came from. But then, find, then having the, uh, the political uh, ability to get these various paintings from private individuals and from museums is is a very interesting uh, skill and uh, and not only that but to to we were eventually we were originally going to travel the exhibit because and now after it's up we actually have inquiries you can't travel way too late to travel at this point but earlier on we had tried to do that and it's, it's very difficult because people will lend some of these are from private lenders and they'll only lend for a certain amount of time 
there's a Jamie show coming up at uh, at Boston Museum of Fine Arts. It's going to be his first retrospective, and they didn't want it. Jamie didn't want this show to have any effect on that, even though it's six months after we closed. That sort of thing. So it really gets it really gets quite complicated. Uh, as far as funding the shows, uh, I think that show. I'm not sure the exact amount, but it was probably around one hundred sixty thousand dollars to to bring that in. And once you get the show together and you get the excitement going, then our development department can get out there and get sponsors for it. And so you'll see, you'll always see the little plaques on the front of the show of, of who's sponsoring and uh, how exactly how much, uh, you don't know, but uh, that's, how we, that's how we fund them. And, and then some of it's probably funded from our, our normal budget that comes from emissions also. But it's, it's kind of a, you know, when you, when you first start out, you don't know exactly, you do a budget in a very, uh, very meticulous on it, but you don't know exactly where, you, where you're going sometimes because you don't know what, what the value of the paintings will be that you'll get and, uh, and, and which ones you know you can't get, and so it takes a while to come together. And we, we don't have to, uh, you, when you do shows like this in general, you don't have to pay anything for the paintings themselves. You don't have to like, like rent the paintings from the owners, uh, but you do have to pay the travel, uh, the insurance costs, and, uh, and any of the preparatory costs. And sometimes the, the owners will request conservation if you want a piece. Or when we loan a piece out to another museum, uh, we'll say, yes, you could have this piece, but you know, it, it needs conservation before it, before it goes, or it won't be safe to go out. And the borrowing institution will often pay for the conservation. Depends on how bad they want it. That's really interesting. Thank you, Rick, and, and everybody who addressed that. Any other questions from the audience about exhibitions, future exhibitions, what's going on? Leslie? I had a question about uh, what type of exhibitions you'll be able to do now that the museum may not have been able to do before with these new galleries. And also my second part of that question is, Will we will the museum be doing more with contemporary artists or not? <laughs> um, as far as what we can do uh, in this space, we are now really unlimited in our vision. In the past, we have had to think of exhibits in terms of the space that we have. So in our web gallery, we have uh, three large galleries and we have two little pass-through galleries. And every exhibit we conceive in there, whether it's the Tiffany exhibit or the steampunk exhibit that Corey did last year, um, the Shaker exhibit that I did, we have to think in terms of, oh, that can go in that little space, and this can go in that little space. And the, the, the space dictates what you can do. Um, in this building, we have a blank slate. We have two galleries that are each 2,500 square feet. We have movable walls. Um, wow, you can create rooms, you can create your own spaces. Um, of course, platforms and bonnets. Um, we have much taller ceilings so that we can uh, bring in uh, larger pieces. We can do a car exhibit in here. We designed this space so that we could bring in vehicles. Um, you can see we already have a, a vehicle uh, in the current exhibit. So we're really unlimited with what we can do um, in our imagination. And the other thing is because the building is has such great state-of-the-art temperature controls, humidity controls, thanks to Rick's planning, we can borrow from institutions that perhaps may have been a little bit wary of lending to us because our exhibit spaces were not as strictly controlled. They were certainly safe, but perhaps not um, didn't have the level of uh, requirements that they wanted. So we really can pretty much do anything that we like. Um, but just from a personal standpoint, in doing the color pattern exhibit that we did, it was I thought it was a little bit hard to think of, you have the whole world in this 2,500 square foot space, you can do anything you want, and it's wow. You know, we're not thinking in terms of these little galleries and these funny little uh, rooms that we have to put art. So I found that was a bit of a challenge, but um, I think we will rise to it in the future. As to the second part of your question, um, yes, we will be focusing on contemporary artists as well. Um, these galleries really offer us the opportunity to produce a conduit for not only the past, but for the present. And I think in something that we do so well at this museum, which is blending the two, connecting them so that people can 
you know, connect to these antiquated objects that, you know, otherwise you would see just in a vitrine. Um, so, yeah, we're going to be doing more contemporary works. And also it allows us to use especially the web gallery for what it was meant to be. The web gallery was built as a paintings gallery. And folks that have been to the museum many years ago, I think probably about 15 years ago now, will remember there's pretty much a permanent paintings exhibit in that building. Uh, we haven't seen it for many, many years because we've been using it as our changing exhibition space. It's not ideal for that, but hey, we've been using it for it and we've been able to do well with it. Uh, next, next year, we're going to reinstall the 50 best paintings from the Shelburne Museum from our collection. And then each year after that, we'll probably tweak it a bit uh, because we have three, three rooms down there. One room could then feature one of our, one of our artists or maybe, maybe full paintings or something like that. So we'll finally have another, uh, we'll probably finally have a paintings gallery back that we haven't had for many years. Uh, in addition to the temperature and humidity, uh, with this, this whole side of the building, the galleries have their own air handlers, so they can hold tighter conditions. And the conditions that we're looking for is 55% uh, 50, in the summer, humidity, plus or minus 5%, and 45% in the winter, plus or minus 5%. And that's for energy savings. It doesn't take as much energy to, to hold the 45% in the winter. Plus, it's uh, the building envelope itself. If we end up uh, putting too much humidity into the space with the cold weather outside, you all know how humidity will condense on windows in, in the winter. And so we, we pull it down to save the building. But this is a very, very tight building. This is probably about the tightest building of this type that's been built in Vermont. Uh, very, very well insulated. And for that reason, it's, it's very, very efficient. The other thing that I'm really excited about in the galleries, and you'll see them when you go over, if you look up, is a lighting system. And it's all, it's all new LED lights, and they're the best LED lights we can get. Uh, there's two types of LED lights. There's the ones that you can just screw into that you can buy at Walmart. That's not what we have over there. We have LED lights that are built from the ground up, and it's one cam fixture that has three different type of reflectors you can put around it, so you can get a wide beam or a narrow beam, and it's such a pleasure to work with those, and from a ceiling height of about 12 feet. The problem with the web gallery is we only had a ceiling right height of about eight and a half to ten feet, and you just can't get the lights back far enough. And this is something that, you know, as you walk in as a public, you wouldn't really you wouldn't really notice that in the web gallery. But yet when you see the pieces up here, you, you'll say, Oh, these look so much better. I wonder why. And this is why, because we can do things that, that can make them look much better because of the technology of the building and, and the, the lighting systems. So thank you. I was thinking about the artists you choose for shows. For instance, Martin Johnson Heed, if I'm remembering the name correctly, he seems to be getting more popular. I see his image, you know, his images in the New York Times, for instance. Do you think about the popularity of an artist when you're planning, or do you think about someone you want to champion, or someone you want to bring back into the Vermont uh, psyche, let's say Grandma Moses, or somebody who might have been out for a while and you want to bring them back. Do you, do you think about things like that when you're planning your exhibitions? We, that's a good question. We do, and I think we also think about what do people want to see? What does, what does the visitor want to see? Um, you know, if we have some great, wonderful new discovery, of course, we want to bring it forth to the public. But I think we're always thinking about what do our visitors of different ages want to see? We're constantly trying to pair exhibits that are very, very different together. Um, for instance, uh, this next uh, winter we had the, uh, you know, this huge three-dimensional uh, sculpture show of John Bisbee's, um, and yet we're pairing that with a glass show, which is uh, based with many pieces in our collection um, that's a very different kind of uh, aesthetic and, and it's, and, I think will appeal to a different audience. So we're thinking of different ages, different demographics. Um, we want to have something here that really will appeal to the whole family, just the, as the way the grounds do. We have different buildings, um, different sites that appeal to different parts of our, our community. And I think that's more what we're thinking about in terms of not trying to force something down your throats, but um, presenting something that you'll get excited about. And, and using names, I think, that that are familiar. Um, we'll be doing a jewelry show uh, in, next year, and we, we want to show jewelry of names that people want to see. They want to see Cartier, they want to see Tiffany, they want to see Harry Winston. 
um, I think that gets people excited. So we're always thinking about you um, and what we think will be attractive. Please let us know. We'd like to see. One of the tests that I've always used that when we talk about what kind of shows that will bring people in, I say, well, if your brother's visiting from Ohio, would you bring him to, to, to see a... Uh, Grandma Moses show? Probably, because you know about Grandma Moses, or certainly the Wyatts, or certainly George O'Keefe. One of my favorite artists is Max Fitters, and he's a collage, collage artist. And I doubt if you said to your brother-in-law in Ohio, let's go see the Max Fitters show, that he'd probably rather go bowling now. But, uh, but this building would allow us to do kind of both, which I think is nice. So it, you know, we could do a major show in one gallery, and then in the other gallery we could do a show of somebody that is less known, uh, but we could still bring in the Crouch and Major show. If you remember the photo photography show from a few years ago, that was, uh, no, who was our photograph? Ansel Adams. Bratinsky and Ansel Adams. Well, the name Ansel Adams brought people in, and they walked out talking about Bratinsky, which were these wonderful, huge industrial color photographs. And that, to me, is the type of thing that, you know, that we could do here, and that, that, that really is exciting. And now we've got a lot more room to do it. And I'll tell you, these things are life-changing because... I had a birthday recently, and they, my friends and my husband said, what do you want to do? And I said, well, I want to go to the Berry Granite Quarries. And I was thinking of the Bertinsky show and how I had said all those years ago, I really want to go see the quarries. And we went, and it was so marvelous. And of course, I had Shelburne Museum in the back of my mind, and they did have a Bertinsky photograph there, so I was able to connect that. So I love the fact that, that the shows that you have are things that people carry with them out of this museum and into our lives in, in a different way. That's a little aside. Did the, did the quarries look like the pictures? Did the what? Did the quarries look like the pictures? Yes, okay. they did. And and it was marvelous. It was pouring rain. It was misty. It was really a, it was really special. You see them differently after you see them through an artist's eyes. Yeah. It was. It was really special. We're asking for questions from the audience about shows, exhibitions, how this gallery is going to be used in the future. Does anyone have anything they want to ask our panel of experts? I see a couple of hands. Okay, come over here. Well, I'm kind of, I love Vermont history, so, and with Pizzagalli being the name of the place, I would love to see, um, so this is a suggestion, not exactly a question, would, I would love to see the history of um, Burlington and Barry, the history of the Italian Americans in Vermont. Interesting. There hasn't, been, like, there hasn't been a large space to, I mean, there have been a lot of different events, and there is the Vermont History Museum in Barrie, but, you know, to have a place, you could even bring in the whole, you know, Ellis Island and how people came up to Vermont, you know, what was the story of that, and... So you want to bring more information about the various groups who settled here, and as an Italian-American, or an Italian person, yeah. So, yeah, but it's the, it's the predominant quarter, isn't it? Yeah, I, I don't know. Anything about Vermont history, that, or is it going to be an ancillary thing when it comes to the shows that we have? It's a good question. Thank you. One of the shows that we're hoping to do, I'm hoping to do in the future, is um, a show on Vermont furniture. Um, we did an exhibit 15 almost 15 years ago was sort of a groundbreaking exhibit that we participated in. We were a venue for this show, and it sort of identified for the first time Vermont furniture as not being this backwater material that beautifully made, very influenced by Boston and Portsmouth designs in urban centers. Um, and I'm hoping to do a follow-up on that, at that show because after uh, the initial exhibit, certain collectors were tuned in on what really makes Vermont furniture, how do I identify it? And they've been quietly collecting over the years. Um, and I'd like to get that material out from these collections, but along the way, I would like to show not just the furniture, but um, the other decorative arts that are, are uh, going on in the history of that town. So we'll see a Rutland chest, but we may have a Rutland bird's eye view, we may have Rutland silver a Rutland quilt, so that there we, we're try, we'll get to the history, but through the art, through the visual part of it. So that's how I see it playing out. Thank you, Jean. And, and I'd recommend, if you haven't been to the Round Barn, there are large blow-ups of 
maps of the various cities in Vermont. So you see all the streets delineated. It's really super. If you haven't been over there, you might want to check that part out. And if you go to the bottom of the round barn, there's all the stonework, and that was all done by Ernie Morelli, who was an, an Italian mason that came over. I just had a question about how you make a judgment about other artworks that come into your exhibits as far as how you describe the absolutely perfect environmental way that this building was created to keep the purity of the environment. And of course, you mentioned that you are judged as to what you're allowed to bring in here by other art institutions. Did I understand that correctly? Because the thing is, how can you be sure that what comes into this beautiful, pristine building is not going to be contaminated to contaminate the pure air? <laughs> Um, when we um, want to borrow something from another museum, we send them what's called a general facilities report, and it's a, st um, a document that's been standardized by the American Alliance of Museums and the Registrar's Group, asking numerous questions about the facilities so uh, the person can't actually physically see the space where their um, work from their collection is going to be. And it asks various questions about the temperature controls, humidity controls, security, insurance, shipping, crating. Um, it's about a 36-page document that we send out that informs um, anybody, whether they're a private lender or another museum, gives them information about the building. And when we lend to other museums, that's what we request of um, another institution wanting to borrow a work of art from our museum. And um, for the most part, if you're willing to lend something, the object is already in good condition or you're not going to lend it. And therefore, we don't necessarily have too many worries about something coming into this space. Um, and we have a conservation staff that, if there are any concerns, can take a look at it when it arrives. We do condition reports when things arrive um, to make sure that everything traveled safely. Thank you. The one aspect of that that you might have to be careful of is uh, uh, in insect infestation. And you, you don't think of it with uh, something like a truly show, but not too long ago, one museum had a truly show with glass. And one of the pieces was a bunch of glass rods sticking out of a large log. And the log, after they brought it in, they had beautiful glass rods up. And uh, the log, that they would go in during the exhibit and people would hear this chewing sound. And actually the log was infested. And, uh, but for, they, you know, they, they, found, they found the bugs. They were trying to figure out how to, to, to uh, fumigate this log and everything. But they found the bugs, they identified them, and, and there's a whole this list of uh, museum pest control. So all these messages were flying around about, you know, send pictures and what is this and whatever. And it turned out it was a bug that really wasn't going to hurt anything in the museum. It, was, it wasn't going to get out into the museum. It was only going to be in that log. And they were able to, you know, just contain it until the exhibit was over and then they were able to throw away the log. But crazy things like that do come up. As far as... Uh, 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 hurting the air in the building. There's a lot of air circulation, a lot of infiltration, and or a lot of filtration of, of the air. And I can't imagine anything that would really, you know, be polluting. Unless we get into con some contemporary things, or maybe something like a car show. And when you think about bringing in cars, if, if it's a car that drove, it has oil in it and gasoline in it and stuff like that. Of course, all of that would have to be taken out before anything is brought into the building. So it is something to consider as we expand the idea of what type of exhibits, what type of artifacts we may be bringing into the building. Well, thank you. I, when you were asking the question, I'm thinking, how, what is this? And this fantastic answer is because I, that was not in my purview. I wasn't thinking about that at all. Thank you. Sir, you had a question. Uh, I'm kind of a fake local guy at times, at any rate. Uh, it occurs to me that in the homes around Shelburne, Burlington, Colchester, up St. Albans and whatever, 
There are a lot of art treasures. And it might be interesting if people would be willing to lend some of their art treasures to do things that are, that come from the locality. They may or may not, in terms of their subject matter, pertain to Vermont. Um, but just some of the kinds of things that, that, that people in the area appreciate enough to have in their homes. When I'm working on one of my exhibitions, and particularly with contemporary artists, I always try to find a local connection. And I, for example, for my glass show, I'll be working with actually more local uh, artists than I have in the past. And I like to do that because not only do these exhibitions, are they designed to give you kind of an overview of what's going on around the world or throughout the country, but also I want people to know what's going on in their own backyards. And I do find that we have a great cache of brilliant and talented artists. So I know from my perspective, I am really cognizant of trying to bring in local materials. We, I think we've also talked um, in the past, I'm not sure where we're going to go with this, we've also talked about showing Vermont collections, because everybody collects something. Um, and I think what you were referring to is that there are Vermonters who collect interesting things, whether they're um, local to Vermont or elsewhere, but they are in the state, and it might be of interest um, to, the, to the rest of us to see that, wow, so-and-so has a collection of whatever, these wonderful one-of-a-kind uh, things that we didn't even know was here. So we, we, I, we talked about doing uh, something with that. Can one of you address the video that was playing here earlier today that focused on collections and how those of us who might have not seen the video can see the video? I don't know if, any, if everyone's aware of this project that was in conjunction with the opening. I think you should pass the microphone. Leslie? Leslie, yeah, Leslie organized Leslie that. Organized that. Uh, I'm Leslie Wright and I do some of the marketing at the museum. Um, we have been collecting uh, information from the public about what they collect as a tie-in to color, pattern, whimsy, scale, which uh, our curators here can tell you more about, but that celebrates Elector Havemeyer's collecting aesthetic. So we asked the public to share with us their collections and we made a video about it and we have a, um, a website where people have submitted photos. And we're just hoping to keep building on that and keep taking submissions. And we're finding exactly that. People collect. Everyone collects. In fact, it's amazing how many employees at this museum collect. Um, and that will be available. It just We just finished the video in time for the opening, and we'll have that uh, available online for people to see. But we want to keep building and keep asking people and, and engaging them in the museum in a way. It's, it's fun. It's interesting. And, and just like Corey said, what's happening in our backyards? What are our friends collecting? And it'll be ongoing. Thanks, Leslie, and I hope that added to what you needed to hear. I think you, was she first? Yes? Oh, okay, here we go. I'm uh, just wondering what criteria you have uh, for people who would like to make gifts to the museum. Um, that's, that is a very good question. Um, we have a document that we have been working on and we're always expanding it and refining it, which is sort of our, our goals for acquiring things. We've looked in a general sense at our 150,000 things, our 60, how many categories? Over 60. 60 categories of types of objects. And we've sort of rated them and decided, you know, we've got um, so many carriages, do we really want to add to the carriage collection or do we feel it's representative of what we have? Um, the doll collection, Mrs. Webb collected um, wonderful dolls, but they were dolls that were old in her time. So we probably don't want to collect contemporary dolls because that is not what she had here. Um, we have a great uh, painted furniture collection from the 1820s, 1830s, we always want more. So if any of you have any great Vermont painted furniture, we would love to have it. So we sort of looked at every collection and 
made a wish list of, yes, we want to add to this collection, and these are sort of specifically the kinds of things that we want, or, you know what, we don't want to add to the collection because either we, we don't need any more pieces, or we, frankly, we don't have space to store it. And Take care these of them. are the, the, the two staff members on the other end who are very much concerned about condition and storage. So we have to sort of keep all of this in mind. So if, if you write to us or call us and ask us if you want to donate something, don't be offended if we say, you know, this is probably, this is a great thing, but it just doesn't fit in or we, we just can't manage it. So but that's a very good question. And one wonderful thing about having this exhibition space is it, it allows us to show objects that we are not collecting. So we're not limited by what our collections are. We can show you a wide variety of items in other people's collections, either museums or private collections, that we will never own, but we want to share them with the public. Some of the things that make artifacts more attractive to us, uh, first of all, we look at Vermont artifacts, after that New England artifacts, and then wider. Uh, our decoys actually do go wider. But uh, if there's very, very good provenance on the piece, let's say there's somebody from, from Colchester that, you know, their great-great-grandmother made this rug while she was living at a camp over on the lake. That's pretty neat, especially if it's a terrific rug that fits in with our rug collection. If that person's great-great-grandmother came from Ohio or Florida, and it's still a wonderful piece, we, you know, may fit in our collection, or we may be able to suggest places that, close to where she lived. Because it means so much more to the people in Florida if it was somebody local, a local historical society or museum there. So we will help try to, you know, suggest where people can place artifacts so that they're they're really appreciated the most. Uh, as Jean says, something like a carriage. You know, the bigger the artifact is, the less likely we are to take it, unless it happens to be just something that, you know, better than something we already have. We have a hearse. We have a really good hearse. But let's say there was a better hearse that came along. Okay, then, then, and then maybe we'd deaccession the, the one we have, one of the carriages we have. But that, we've been offered buildings in the past. We've been offered 1950 gas stations in the past, which are kind of neat, you know? But I'm not, I'm not sure they really fit, and I don't think we're gonna get into moving another building down there. But we get calls, we get several calls a year, that, oh, we have a building that we, we don't wanna just go away, you know? So, but I think the best thing is just get in touch with us and with pictures and things like that and then we can move it from there. Thank you. Yeah, as a guide, I get people asking, I want to donate, or where do I go to have this conserved or have this repaired? And so we try to send them in the right direction, but certainly not everything fits, fits as, as Rick just said, into what we show. You had a question. We're coming over. How often does the... Um Let's say the trustees of the museum, I mean, how often do they have a say in what kind of exhibit or exhibit goes on, or do they have any at all? That's a good question. I think it depends on really the exhibit. There's no protocol that the trustees have to approve of, of everything or that they even uh, have any say at all. But um, for instance, when uh, we did the fashion show a couple of years ago, uh, I have one, we have one wonderful trustee whose uh, son and, and partner are in Paris and are connected to the fashion industry and was very instrumental in helping us acquire some wonderful pieces. And I suspect that the same, um, uh, the same trustee will be very instrumental for the jewelry show. So if a trustee has a special uh, connection or special interest, they will, we welcome their input in terms of finding objects. But as far as ideas go, they can obviously suggest anything they want, but it's really up to us in the end as to what we do, which is nice. Questions? Yes. One more, <laughs> one more question. Actually, it's probably for the registrar. I'm just very curious as a as someone interested in archives, how you actually keep records of past exhibits, because I assume you're trying to maintain a history of the museum. So it's probably all digitized. Do you go in and actually film the, the, the objects in place and give a sense of the, the entire space in which the objects are, are placed? And are the, 
three uh, all uh, are the the objects looked at from every single angle and then put on record and then where is it stored also I just curious because I assume if someone wants to come up with another exhibit you want to say well we did this 15 years ago or something like it you want to go back and look and see what the record was and what went wrong and what did what didn't go wrong. Yeah. Well, we do have an archivist, and when the curators um, have completed an exhibition, there is information that goes to the museum archives. We also take documentary photos of the exhibitions, and in certain instances, we hire a um, professional photographer to take good um, professional um, photographs to promote the museum. Um, and for the um, registrar staff, we have a database um, for the objects that were in the process of um, entering all of the museum's collections into the database. And we can take the exhibition history, and that is one of the fields in the database. So for instance, um, Wyeth Vertigo Soaring will now have in its exhibition history that it was in Wyeth Vertigo. And we do the same thing when a um, painting travels to um, another museum or a number of venues. Um, we add that to its exhibition history. We do that not only to track the exhibition history, but also for conservation, how often it's traveled, how much light exposure. We do that with the um, textiles. They're um, very sensitive to light, so the um, quilts and hat and fragrance get rotated out um, every two years, and we keep track of that as the exhibition history, so we know how much light things are getting exposed to. We do the same thing with the place near watercolors. I have a question about film. Is it, now that we have this space where we can show films, is that something that the curators are going to be doing and working on, or is that something that's going to be education department? Where, where's the line between that? Well, for our upcoming exhibition on John Bisbee, he doesn't want to over-intellectualize things with curatorial labels. And so one of the things that these new um, technologically uh, equipped galleries are allowing us to do is bring in video. And so you'll see him in the process of making these pieces. So there it becomes part of a didactic environment. This is not to say that at some point we won't do an exhibition of just video art. And if we do, it will probably be contained in the actual gallery space. I think the education department has developed a series of kind of film programs that will be um, just later played in this space. Other questions about upcoming exhibits or exhibitions? from the audience? Okay, let me just add, um, we have been talking about primarily this building, but of course we still have the grounds open, um, you know, for half of half the year, and so we still are involved with uh, new shows in the Fleissner Gallery because we rotate the, the watercolors. New quilt shows uh, next year, I'm very excited that we will be, I'm trying to do contemporary artists in uh, the uh, Hat and Fragrance Gallery. This year we have Velda Newman, who is a fabulous California artist. She's actually coming here in September and will be giving a gallery talk. Next year, I'm very excited that Nancy Crow, who is a major uh, quilter from, from the 70s, probably, I would say, our most well-known American quilter, will be displaying some of her latest work here. So, and of course, as Rick mentioned, the paintings, the American paintings will be out for the first time in a number of years, the top 50 paintings. So there's more to be seen on the grounds outside of this building. So it's, it's not just here, but it's also the rest of the, of the grounds as well. And that's going to be a challenge for us, I think, uh, to not only, you see what the artifacts like, look like in color whimsy, when we take them out of their context in some of our buildings, we maybe can hardly see them in a historic room or something and bring them up here under good lighting. And so that's one aspect that we're concentrating on today with this new building. But the other aspect is how do we make sure that the people come in, see what's wonderful in this building, and then want to go and see more. We have our glass canes downstairs, and we've got 10 of them. They're beautiful. How many glass canes do we have? 168. Largest collection in the United States on display. Okay, largest collection in the United States. And they're all down. All, many, many of them are in the, in the, in the variety unit. it. So we've got to make sure we make those connections because that's a way of deepening the experience that people have come in for years and said, 
okay, where's the museum? Uh, thinking it's a building, if they're not familiar with this area. Well, now we can point over and we can say, well, there's the museum. You know, there's one of the buildings in the museum. That's where you can start. But if you want a deeper experience, uh, you, you see some nice decoys in here. Guess what? You've got the best decoy collection in the world sitting down there in a the building. Let's go down and see that. So that's something we want to make sure we continue to integrate and let people know about. Well, I think with the good press that we've gotten from the opening of this building, we've really raised our uh, status, our uh, yeah, visibility, um, mainly. all around the country, if not the world. And I think that's going to really help, too. So the shows that we put on here or out in the rest of the, the museum certainly are going to get a little more interest. And if we keep up this level, which I think has been sustained for the last few years since I've been here. Mm -hmm. It just keeps seeing, it seems to get better and better every year, and people are just very, very enthusiastic. I don't know, how do you feel? Are, are you enjoying the trajectories that we're taking as a museum? Some modern things, some bringing back some old favorites, things. Is this, is this working for everybody? Yeah, you're making me think this, is, this has got to be the only museum where there's such an extensive historic collection that you can use, like over 100,000 objects, that you can use to complement and bring in contemporary exhibits or exhibits from other museums. I mean, I, I can't think of any other museum that can do that. So that's why Shelburne's so unique. That's true as a guide very in the Jamie Wyeth, he's got that wonderful ram's head painting of himself, and that often leads the guides to say, well, if you if you really like that, Patty Yoder's rugs, those those sheep have personality just like Jamie Wyeth's painting does. And so I think it's really important when as as a community of, of employees or volunteers and as people in the community that we, we talk about the various things that are available because not everybody knows. They're often very stunned when they pay their money and, and there it is. There's so much to explore and they don't really know where to begin. I think this is going to be a great beginning point. And this year too we have new things in our, our uh, little handout or program, there's probably a word for it, that tells people if you just want fine arts or if you really want to focus on transportation or children's things, I think that was a really good idea for people to know where to go. It kind of is a mini guide. I think that that's a resource that maybe we overlook sometimes, but it's, it's really spectacular. It really sent people in directions that they might have missed the last time. I'm coming up with ideas here, but we can wrap early. You have one more question. When a, when a uh, like a painting or an object goes out, um, I'm wondering does it get does it get extensively photographed before it goes out, and then it photographed at the institution that it's at, and does, and then does it and then that way you can see if there's anything that you you know you had at the beginning and at the end. Yeah, um, we do take a photograph of the artwork before it leaves and we write a condition report um, and we can take the photograph and mark on the photo all of the um, various things that we're seeing as far as you know, tenting paint or an old mark, anything that would stand out to make us think perhaps something has occurred while it's been in transit and then the uh, receiving institution checks the condition report um, looking at the photo noting any changes and then when it comes back here at the end of um, its travels we check it again so we're constantly monitoring um, the conditions. Does somebody go down to the actual museum to, 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 to hand it to the museum? Yes, and, okay. yeah, depending on what we lend um, there will be a courier that goes with the artwork um, and make sure that it arrives safely and uh, gets home safely. It's something when one of these exhibits comes in, like the Wyeth exhibit. I mean, uh, Barbara will plan out a whole two-week uh, time when the paintings are coming in, the couriers are coming in, you got to put the couriers up somewhere. Uh, they come in, they meet with the, if it's a conservator coming in, they'll meet with the other art conservators. And it, it's really it's an exciting time when you see one of these shows being unveiled. And often they'll want to see the piece hung directly on the wall where it's going to be before they leave. 
And of course, they, you know, you, they won't bring anything in until all the paint's dry and it's a whole bit. So it's a real orchestration. Uh, the public just opens up and comes in and sees it. They don't see what's, what's behind the scenes on that. It's pretty exciting stuff. And we're going to be doing that once every three to four um, months now in this new building if, as we borrow things from other institutions. So it's going to be a very, very busy few weeks in between exhibitions. And at times, the, the, the upstairs uh, exhibit and the downstairs exhibit won't necessarily change at the same time, will they? They'll actually be, be kind of staggered so that there's always something for somebody to see. And then that also offers a, a challenge of, of how you do that, especially if there's a film festival, festival going on and some classes downstairs. So one of, one of my favorite parts of the building, I think, I think all of us, when it was first being planned, uh, Stefan Yost, their last director, uh, he was used to using a building without a loading dock. It was a university museum. And he said, oh, we'll just unload into the gallery. And all of us were saying the type of exhibits we're planning on doing need, need a loading dock. And uh, when and so we were we were really fighting for this loading dock, and we kind of got a, a a little special loading space, you know, with at least a door that a, a truck could pull up to. And uh, when our director now, Tom Denberg, came in, he looked at the plans because he was coming right in as we were starting to build it, and he said, "Where's the loading dock?" And we all said, "Ah, oh, we're so glad you asked." <laughs> and so you know, we now have a loading dock, and not only a loading dock, but then you have a room that a, a receiving room that's separate from the gallery. And that's very important because, you know, it, it, you just can't unload into the gallery and have all the packing materials around, that sort of thing. So we really do, we made sure that we're set up to handle the type of exhibits that we can bring in. And it's important as other museums decide to, to lend something to you. In fact, one of the questions in the, in the uh, facilities report talks about a loading space and does it have special controls for the loading space and that sort of thing. And if you just say, we're going to load into the, into the gallery, uh, you might not get the pieces that you want from those museums. So that's some of the other thoughts that go into it. I'm looking, we have five minutes left. Is there any burning question? Okay, what I'm going to ask is, does anyone have final statement, something they'd like to tell us or something we haven't asked about that you think is important to share right now before we end this day? Jean? I think we've sort of covered everything. I'm, I'm pleased. Um, I'm just hoping that you all will um, come and see us and tell your friends to come and let us know what you think because we do, feedback is important to us because we are doing these exhibits not just for us, we're doing it for the public. So it would be helpful to know if you feel we're on the right track um, or if we've gone astray somewhere. Corey? I just hope that the public is, is as excited as I am about the possibilities that this facility presents us with because really it's an unlimited um, group of things that we can do now. And um, I'm so excited and I'm sure I'm going to have a lot of my ideas shot down because they're over the top. But I'm used to that. I'm just thrilled we're, we're never going to be closed again. We're open year-round. And I, as Jean said, I encourage everyone to tell their friends to come and come often and enjoy the museum. It is your museum. Rick? Well, I've listened into a number of, of these discussions and the one place I haven't been able to talk about it, nobody has. And it's our fire suppression system in here. And you got to know about this. It's not Tell fire suppression, it. but they, I, I got to say it, you know. But it's called a VESTA, Very Early Smoke Detection Apparatus. And what it does, it has little tubes all around the building, and they're constantly sucking air, and they're constantly sampling air, and taking it through a machine that's a laser machine. And it can detect fire before the fire starts. It can detect fire, the, the chemicals when two wires are up together, you know, there's a chemical that comes off and it can detect that before a fire starts. So there, I said it. But it just, it just gives you an idea of, of the sophistication of this building and, and what we do to protect the art. It really is a spectacular building and a fantastic show if you haven't been over to see it. Color pattern, whimsy, scale. It's really special. And I don't know how you chose from all the objects and all the designs and all the silly things and wonderful things that we have. But you're absolutely right. Things jump out over there. Things that people just walk past that I've walked past before. So thank you for what you've done. I'd also point out for those of us who've been in here for many hours, it's been like there's this art 
project happening on the wall behind you with the, the shadows and the light. And as this, when whoever watches this film of this is going to see that, it's going to be one of the, the nice things about re-watching this. It's the art show on the wall behind us. So I know that everyone has things they want to do. There's more happening on campus, including a wine tasting in a little while. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone on our panel and Jean, Corey, Barbara, and Rick, and I know you all want to put your hands together and applaud and thank them for what they do for Shelburne Museum. Have a great evening, everybody. Thank you for coming.